Hello? Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. I thought I lost. Just waiting for a few more minutes. Okay. We just no, want no, to not a problem. No, I thought I was okay. disconnected. So, so Sama? Shall we, we start, start Sama, and then you know people can join? Yes, yes, we can start. We are live. Yeah, we're live. Okay, let's start then. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. On behalf of the organizing committee for the IIDS webinar series on politics, economy, and public policy, we warmly welcome you to episode number 25. The title of the talk today is Reimagining the Vernacular Construction for Disaster Risk Education. And, and this is pretty relevant given, you know, just uh, this morning, uh, there was a 7.8 magnitude earthquake that struck very early while people were, were asleep. And in fact, the news says that hundreds of people are dead. You know, this happened in southeastern Turkey near the Syrian border. So very relevant and given, you know, the 2015 earthquake that we've had in Nepal. The presenter today, we're very honored, is Mr. Jitenda Bothara, who is the director of Resipro International Engineering Limited, Mr. Botara actually joins us from New Zealand. Mr. Jitendra Botara is a fellow of engineering New Zealand, New Zealand Society for Earthquake Engineering and Nepal Engineers Association. He's also the director of Recipro International Engineering Limited, a New Zealand based company. With more than three decades of experience in seismic engineering and disaster risk mitigation, he has led teams for pre and post earthquake assessments in many countries, including Nepal. Mr. Botara has co-authored and published several publications you know, related to earthquake engineering, including various building standards, guidelines, and manuals, and has also helped develop earthquake engineering research facilities. Mr. Botara also provides advisory services to the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the Government of Nepal, and the United Nations Development Program on DRR, Earthquake Recovery and Re Reconstruction, related to most, most of his work is, of course, related to seismic engineering related to earthquake. His interests include translating research and complex engineering concepts into implementation tools, and that's what the presentation is about today, ladies and gentlemen, and disseminating technology, vernacular and heritage construction, and socio-cultural and economic issues. Mr. Botara, originally from Nepal, now lives in New Zealand with his family. Thank you very much, Mr. Botara. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have Mr. Rajendra Desai for our discussant. We're indeed very honored, sir. Mr. Desai is a structural engineer by education, joins us today from New Jersey. So imagine, ladies and gentlemen, we have our speaker from New Zealand, our discussant from um, the United States, and us, you know, joining from Nepal. I'm actually from, you know, I'm currently in, in the UK. So, you know, four or five continents, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Desai is presently working as an honorary joint founder director of Center for eco Center Development and People's Action which is also you know, called CDAP, based in Ahmedabad in India. Mr. Desai holds a BTEC from IIT, the prestigious IIT, Bombay, and an MS in structures from Rutgers University, New Jersey. Mr. Desai has been working on disaster risk education in rural areas from 1994 till today, with focus on dissemination of appropriate building technologies through education of building artisans, as well as engineers, and demonstrations in different natural disaster prone areas of Nepal and Nepal of India and Nepal, you know, and the principal focus, of course, is on seismic hazard. Mr. Desai has contributed to a number of national and international publications and has also received several distinguished awards, such as in 2018, he, with his wife jointly, was the recipient of Jamnalal Bazaar's Award for the Application of Science and Technology in Rural Housing. Thank you very much, Mr. Desai, for joining us today from New Jersey. Some uh, house rules, ladies and gentlemen, Please mute your microphones when not speaking. During the Q&A, please raise your hand if you want to speak, or you can just type your questions in the chat box. If possible, please turn your video when asking questions. And please kindly do not interrupt other people or attempt to speak over them. Over to you, uh, Mr. Jitendra Bothara. Thank you, sir. Hello. We can hear you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Pravinji, for the kind introduction. And good morning. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. Chora, Jitena uh, from New Zealand. In my today's presentation, I will be discussing about rediscovering 
or reimagining uh, the vernacular construction for disaster risk reduction. So basically vernacular constructions are there, particularly I will be focusing on the buildings. So buildings are there, we are trying to rediscover them to reduce uh, the effect of disaster on us. Thanks to IIDS for the opportunity to sharing my thought. In my today's presentation, I'll be talking about the vernacular buildings, but the goal is not to glorify or romanticize uh, the construction system and to bash uh, anybody or any other system. But my objective is to objectively investigate student rise the vernacular buildings in today's context as live building system. Then I will be discussing about why a balance is required between vernacular construction and modern construction uh, for better seismic safety. And why research and promotion of vernacular buildings is important. So basically my presentation will be uh, around these um, topics or issues. But before I proceed, I think it's important to define what is a vernacular and what is a modern. Because what is a vernacular today, uh, modern today, we could be more vernacular in the next 50 years. For example, the construction system that we are using currently, considering the, the modern one, may be considered just vernacular in 100 years time. So it is important to define what they mean. What I mean by vernacular buildings is, the knowledge that has, or the vernacular knowledge, I mean the knowledge that has accumulated progressively over time, over generations from experience, observations, and adapting to local environment and context. So it is empirical. So the roots of the knowledge has in the community. Whereas the modern science is basically outcome of, or modern knowledge is basically outcome of science and technology arising from European scientific revolution in 17th century. So it is a more evidence-based. So the knowledge relating to present or present recent times as opposed to the report, uh, remote past. So we are, they, they work differently. Uh, one is empirical and other is evidence-based. I will Keep this presentation as simple as possible. There's no mathematics. Only mathematics here I have used is vernacular is equivalent to traditional, in my definition. So it's no further mathematics. But how we perceive vernacular and modern buildings? So the knowledge I am, I will start to talk from the knowledge. I moved to buildings now. So how we perceive them? When somebody talks about vernacular, we think that's a primitive. A bit old, maybe unsafe, dirty, obsolete, whereas the modern is advanced because they're coming from Europe or North America. Uh, that's how the defined uh, modern is defined. It's a new, safe, clean, up to date, evidence based, industrialized, so we can boost construction. It's a comfortable, but the most importantly, and from social perspective, is a rich man's house, whereas the vernacular is poor man's house. So now it is associated with our social status. And I will be talking, are these, our, is our perception right? Or somewhere uh, there is a problem in what we understand. We talk, oh, modern buildings are safe, but are they? We all know about 2015 earthquake where both vernacular buildings and modern buildings. When we say modern, these are uh, constructed of concrete and steel, both suffer damage and destruction and people are killed in both buildings. Of course, more people are killed in vernacular buildings because the more, more number of vernacular buildings are damaged or destroyed. And of course, these are weaker buildings because of obvious reasons, which I will talk a little bit later. But before I proceed and talk about more on vernacular, what I thought is we knew about safer building construction. We know about safer building construction. We knew about it in the past, even before the earthquake, the 2015 earthquake. But 
why that knowledge didn't help us, the technical knowledge didn't help us to safeguard us from the earthquake and why 9,000 people were killed. To me, safety is not a technical issue. It's a technical issue, but it's a minor uh, issue if you look from a bigger global perspective. It's an issue of affordability. It's an issue of cultural identity. It's an issue of literacy, accessibility to information, resources, uh, money. Um, it's a belief system because different religions take safety in a very different way. And of course, either we like or not like, our beliefs are formed away from our childhood. How we internalize the knowledge and observation and the empowerment. So safety, when we look at what my experience is, we need to look at all these issues, not the technical issue, because talking technical knowledge we had, but that couldn't make us safe. As I discussed, uh, talked in the very beginning, what we consider is modern is safe. To me, it is a paradox. Let's say a few examples. We know Karfandu Valley. It's a river valley civilization or river civilization. What happened to Kathmandu? I never heard about flood in Kathmandu, but in the last few years, we have flood practically every year. We all are university graduates or uni educated, have great education from big universities. But why we created this disaster? To me, Kathmandu Valley has a fantastic, very efficient, drainage system. But what we created is a hill. Why the knowledge didn't help us? Why the modern knowledge didn't help us? Did we break the social fabric in the need for the modernity? So we need to look into this issue, why modernity is not able to, or modern concepts knowledge is not able to protect us. There's another the example. This photograph, both photographs I took after 2005 earthquake, uh, in Kashmir, in Pakistan. The bottom photograph is of a hospital. It still was not commissioned when earthquake struck. And you can see it is totally destroyed. It is a reinforced concrete frame building, modern construction, well-designed, but total destruction. Whereas the upper building, the top photograph, looks a very primitive, rudimentary building, but it survived. Both buildings are hardly a kilometer apart. So the question is, does the engineering input alone can save us or protect us? And then we also need to think, what is the coverage of engineered buildings? How much we can cover? Other question is, the engineering system requires, is a high intensity system and requires high rigor and quality control, which usually we don't have. Another example, this photograph I took after the 2000, 15 earthquake is near Bara Bishe, hardly 15 kilometers away from the epicenter uh, of Tubel Me earthquake, and building perfectly survived. We think stone masonry buildings, stone buildings are bad, vernacular buildings are rudimentary, but it survived very well. That means it meet uh, the, the, the life safety requirement, that uh, it's a functional requirement. Another example is again from Gorkha. It's hardly 12 kilometers uh, from the epicenter. And you can see on the left photograph, there is a, these high school buildings. And on the left photograph, you can see a steel structure where the structure is still standing, but the walls fell. Had there been children inside, children would have been dead. That means building couldn't meet its minimum requirement. Whereas the building on the left and building on the right, both survived very well. Both are constructed of stone masonry, mud mortar with nominal uh, intervention, some, something like bands and vertical bars. And these buildings survived well. So that means modern building couldn't meet its functional requirement or life safety requirement. Whereas the traditional building or vernacular building, if you construct well properly and with minimal intervention, we can improve them. Here is another example from Kashmandu Valley. The building on the right, there are two buildings. Building on the right is a brick building in mud mortar. 
but it was retrofitted before the earthquake. Building on the right is a frame building. We would call that modern building. And practically in Nepal, the frame building has become de facto building from, uh, because of the social status. We will always think the frame building is a good building, safer building, the right building, which is a brick building, and mud mortar is a bad building. But the earthquake has shown, clearly shown, that the left building has suffered far more damage. As had the earthquake been little longer, this building were would have uh, suffered catastrophic failure. Whereas the right building practically survived very well without any major damage. What it indicates, we need to understand that vernacular buildings can be safer. And I'm looking from, when I say disaster risk reduction, of course, I'm looking from the uh, earthquake engineering perspective or earthquake safety perspective. Same could apply to wind or any other disasters. So because of my interest in vernacular construction, I have collected a lot of samples building types from far east Himalayas, starting from Bhutan, to far west next, near Afghanistan border in Pakistan. It's because of my interest. So wherever I go in Himalayas, I collect building types. I talk to local people. And what I found, and then I analyzed these buildings, seismic safety. These are vernacular buildings, and you can see the photographs. Of course, there are a lot of gaps in the uh, building types, but whatever I analyzed, I found these buildings have performed extremely well. And few of these examples are from Nepal. Nathpola, five-tier temple, which has survived very well, multiple time, multiple earthquakes. And that shows the vernacular construction can provide seismic safety. We did some testing also to see how vernacular buildings work. And here is a stone masonry building. And we have put on a sack table. Sack table is a table which can be shaken to any dynamic load. It can vibrate. And so we can test the building to any earthquake loading or earthquake vibration. This is a stone masonry building in mud mortar. And you can see uh, there are a few bands and some vertical bars or splints and other things. And this building we designed for schools, but we tested it uh, to see how it performs. Sorry, there is no sound, uh, but you can see the vibration and how building survives. So what it indicates is, and this earthquake, I think if I remember right, the shaking was, rec we in the input shaking to the table was recorded in Kirtipur. So practically the input motion was the 2015 earthquake shaking recorded in Kirtipur. And building survived very well uh, with very minimal input. We did some testing after the 2015 earthquake. And of course, uh, it was in leadership of Ryan Desai, who is also today's uh, commentator. And we did shock table test, not shaking table test, because shaking table is very expensive. Uh, my interest was to install a shaking table in Nepal, uh, something like 20 ton capacity, and that would cost us more than 5 million US dollars. So I couldn't find anybody. Um, but anyway, uh, we did, did this testing in um, uh, Gujarat, in Ahmedabad, where we call it shock table, where we hit the table with a big hammer. And so this building is a basically a vernacular building with timber bands, some wires tie up and other things. And let's see the how building performed. And we did very intensive vibration or shaking or impacts and the building survived very well. Let's see other example. This is from Nepal. We couldn't construct a shaking table in Nepal, but somehow with help of UNDP, and we are very thankful to UNDP, UNDP's support, we constructed a shock table in Nepal at Pulcho campus. 
And our first test was to test how we can retrofit existing vulnerable stone masonry buildings. So we constructed two stone masonry buildings. The left one was retrofitted and right one is as commonly built. And then we tested it. So you can see the test. And of course, you can see a lot of wires and everything. These wires are accelerometers. These, these are like a stethoscope doctor uses to record our uh, heartbeat and other things. So exactly the same thing. We are recording vibration and what is happening to building. So you can see uh, what happens to building. So the building on the right, the left, suffered severe damage. It's almost about to collapse, but building on the right, which was retrofitted with very nominal input, survived very well. Let's see, let's see what happens, what happened. And you still you can see the building on the left is still standing, which was retrofitted. And, but the not retrofitted building totally collapsed. This building is still standing at Pulso campus on the shock table and people are, students are still testing them. And still building is standing even after a very severe shaking or impacts. What it indicates, what is so is vernacular buildings can be made safer, but we need to invest on them. We have not invested on vernacular construction. And that's where the problem is. And I will talk more on this uh, later. I did some comparison of various things, energy input, cost, and how it would work. After work earthquake for construction, we did some cost analysis. A typical stone masonry building in mud mortar with strengthening, earthquake strengthening feature would cost something like 150 US dollars per square meter. But if, you, if we construct a brick building, not strengthened in cement mortar, the cost will be almost two times. If it's a frame building, cost will be almost two and a half times. So the question is, how many people can afford the modern construction, the, the, the so-called modern construction. That's the point. Other issues when we think of building systems, we need to understand the vernacular buildings requires minimal importation of material. So basically all the materials come from the uh, local area. It means local cash flow pattern. Of course, the things has changed because of the remittance, but if you look at the uh, in remote areas, still it meets the cash flow pattern because people have money after the after they harvest the crop and the rest of the time they are free so they can collect material. It's affordable for local communities, uses local skills. So basically it provides local employment and strength and local economy. So we need to factor this when we think of uh, vernacular and modern construction because building is not only a roof, it's the more than that. And it's a life's major investment. We did some survey. What we found is in Gorkha, more than 68% of people has to take loan to construct their house. And the interest rate was something like 24 to 36%. So if we push harder for modern construction, which costs more, that means people have to take loan. And that means they have to pay interest on that. At the end of the day, they can't pay the interest, they can't pay the mortgage, that means end up they will end up selling their houses. That means we are creating second cycle of disaster. So, but if it's a vernacular construction, they may be able to afford that. I'm looking at the energy and I just looked at the embodied energy. We all talk about climate change and uh, greenhouse gas and we all talk about reducing them. We did some calculations. Of course, calculations came from Ryan the design. Uh, and what we found is for vernacular construction, stone masonry in mud mortar with nominal uh, strengthening inputs, 
if energy required, embodied energy is X, we need more than, we have to spend more than seven times more energy if we are constructing a brick building in cement mortar with RC roof. But if it's a frame building, the energy consumption will be still more than six times. The energy consumption in frame building is little less in our case because our walls are just four inch thick. But the four inch thick walls in building creates another disaster because these walls are too hot inside the space in the house is too hot during summer and too cold inside during winter. If you look at the thermal comfort, basically the vernacular buildings uses passive energy. Whereas the modern construction is very, very intense, energy intensive. And I will ask you how many people, how many among you and I myself, are sitting in air conditioner room to keep ourselves comfortable. And then we talk about uh, climate change and, uh, uh, and energy conservation and uh, reducing greenhouse gas. So I see a paradox in our whole process. So when we talk about building and when we talk about energy, the energy required to uh, extract material, process material, produce something and then construct something, then operate the building over the life. And then of course, at the end of the life building uh, has to be demolished or pulled down or a disaster may pull it down. Good thing with vernacular construction is, and what we found is more than 60% of material can be salvaged and recycled. And you can see buildings here. Uh, the top photograph is from Nepal and bottom photograph is from Pakistan. So as the, we are processing the same material just without disturbing the nature, so that means we are keeping the carbon footprint minimum. Whereas in modern construction, if it's a frame building, and you all have, may have seen in Kathmandu Valley after the 2015 earthquake, how much energy was required to demolish the damaged buildings. And then it has to be transported somewhere and thrown away. So think of the total energy required to, to throw something which we spend so much of money and then the energy. And then we are spending more energy. So what I want, I want to say is this modern construction requires a lot of energy. They are highly energy intensive systems. So this brings us to a conclusion. If we are talking about vernacular construction, they are very low energy systems because they require minimal energy for production, processing, transportation. There's a minimum haulage because many material is coming from a surrounding area. Only marginal or very minimal material is coming from outside. So, and that means the it helps local economy to grow. Is it recyclable? And if you think of operation of building, the building system itself provides us uh, the thermal comfort. These buildings are smart and climate responsive uh, because that's how they developed over the time because they developed due to, because of our experience and observation. Whereas if you look at uh, the modern buildings, they are, they present everything in contrary. So the Barna and vernacular buildings, as I showed you, presented few slides and videos and testing, can provide seismic safety in a sustainable way. But importantly, these conserve our culture because culture is what I stand for. That's what my identity is. But in the name of modernity, we are homogen homogenizing everything. And socioeconomically, vernacular construction is more viable. And other thing is a decentralized system because there's a minimal engineering input. Engineering input is expensive. And no large majority of people can't afford. So the knowledge has to be decentralized for people's safety and improvement. But what is the current scenario? 
This is the building type we live. And I did some statistical analysis um, from the national statistics or national population census of India, Pakistan, and Nepal. More than 80%, 70 to 80% buildings in Nepal are vernacular. They are traditional buildings. Similar in India, something like 80%, similar in Pakistan. If we consider brick and stone in cement mortar is a modern building, still more than 70 to 70% buildings in Nepal are vernacular. If we consider brick and stone traditional, maybe 90% buildings in Nepal are vernacular. This is the scenario. I wished because it's a very large number of buildings, big proportion of buildings. There should have been a lot of standards, guidelines, documents, so we can design better vernacular buildings. But the unfortunate fact is, this doesn't exist. Practically, no or very limited academic courses on design of vernacular buildings exist. I have delivered lectures at in India, in many uh, institutes, many universities, in Nepal, Pakistan, and many other countries, and working with many and work with many universities over the time. Practically none of the university offer courses on vernacular construction, or there could be an earlier paper. I would share, a, I would like to share with you a story of my a story from, I was in year four, uh, fourth year, year of engineering, it was 1988 when the 2000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, uh, more than 700 people, 721 people. So that was concern for me because I was born in a murder house. And uh, so I asked one of my teachers, when we are to study this vernacular construction? And his flat, straight, and but very harsh response was, vernacular buildings are primitive, they are old and ugly and they are not safe. We should be studying modern construction like concrete buildings, frame buildings, steel buildings, which are uh, safer. After more than three decades of my work as an engineer, worked on many, many, many countries, maybe more than 15, 20 countries in different scenarios, I am more confused than when I was in year four. Has modern construction provided the safety my teacher was talking? And I think, no, it has not. Had that been happened, 9,000 people would not have been killed after the 2015 earthquake and 80,000, almost 80,000 people would have not been killed after 2005 in Pakistan. I think it is again, uh, to me, to a notion only that modern construction will solve all our problems. I did another analysis. I was invited to deliver a uh, keynote speech at um, one conference in India, where altogether 212 papers were presented. Out of that, 110 papers were on building systems. Interestingly, only Six papers, sorry, eight papers were presented on vernacular construction. Masonry, confined masonry, uh, wood and bamboo. There are all together paper. That's a 7% of the paper over on vernacular construction. The country, India, where 80% buildings are vernacular, only 7% building are uh, the papers or research papers were on vernacular construction. That shows our twisted priority. Until we fix our priority, I don't think we can, we can afford 
uh, seismic safety or any other disaster risk reduction efforts in sustainable way. If I look at Surrey state, and I call it Surrey state, because the way we are trained, we think only of concrete and steel. After 2015 earthquake, I was invited by the United Nations to support uh, prepare strategic planning for reconstruction and recovery, where Rajna Desai also uh, was one of the members. And we have worked together on many other things. And there was a big effort by many people, maybe with good heart, that they wanted to ban use of mud mortar or stone masonry citing safety reasons. Because stone masonry are unsafe buildings, many people are killed, so we should ban it. Or at least we should ban mud mortar. But is that possible where the haulage distance is four days walk? If you have to carry cement from nearest road, you have to, it will take four days to just to transport cement. How you transport? Still, and people have no understanding. They are just thinking of safety. Same saga was after the 2005 uh, Kashmir earthquake where I worked. Same saga, same story was after the Gujarat earthquake, 93 Latur earthquake, or even 2003 um, Bam earthquake in Iran where I worked. So the reason is the advisors are the engineers and they don't understand vernacular construction, because they are never trained. They are never taught vernacular construction. So the vernacular construction buildings are everywhere, but the buildings are like uh, elephant in the room. Uh, elephant is there, but nobody is able to see it. So exactly the same is happening with vernacular construction and the systems and materials. The Surrey state is, there is a restriction on timber harvesting in many areas, even in India, Nepal, and other parts of the world. Even I, le I learned stone excavation is restricted in parts of India, especially in Himalaya, citing reasons for uh, environmental conservation. But what we are actually doing in the name of environmental conservation, we are promoting cement and steel, its production, transportation, and demolition uh, after uh, its life has uh, done. So basically, at one end, we are restricting low conserv high conservation system or low energy intensive system, and then promoting high energy intensive system. So I see a whole paradox here again. So time to move. Of course, I talked the great things about vernacular buildings. But does that solve our problem? We need to understand that vernacular buildings are good buildings, but the romanticizing with them doesn't solve our problem. The reasons are our aspirations have changed. Our expectations have changed. And the local availability materials have their own limitations. We can't expect somebody constructing a stone masonry building in the center of Kathmandu. Or in a city centers or high population areas, of course we have to move to modern construction because we have to accommodate large population. But why propose the same system in remote area of Gorkha? So we have to find a balance where vernacular and modern construction can converge and can provide our, us the best outcome. So rather than promoting one system, let's look at how we can balance a whole system and converge them for best outcome. So it is important to find balance. As I mentioned, a stone masonry building or a timber building may not be suitable in center of Kathmandu Valley or in the center of Kathmandu city, but a um, frame building is not required in the name of safety in remote area of Gorkha or remote area of Sindhu Palsu. 
So we need to understand the technology and materials, the evolution process, how we can conserve, converse them. And then how we can send, decentralize the knowledge that will empower users. Of course, that will require research and we have to reinvent a lot of things, but the ultimate goal is to provide options to people so people can make um, choice. But we also need to understand this balance or the, con the, the balance is a line on sand. It will keep changing depending on what I can afford, what are my aspirations are, and what I expect. So the take home message from um, today's presentation, in my opinion, are vernacular buildings could provide earthquake risk reduction in a sustainable way. Because the vernacular buildings solutions are affordable, they are low energy intensive, and people can easily afford them. And these meet local requirements and this will able to save our uh, cultural identity. But we need to find a balanced point for convergence of modern and traditional techniques and building systems. But as I mentioned earlier, the convergence point or the line is a contextual, depends on location, uh, our affordability, our aspirations. But of course, to bring that level of safety, knowledge dissemination is very important for confidence building in vernacular construction. We have invested very heavily to discard vernacular buildings. We have invested very heavily to destroy any confidence in vernacular buildings. And when I say knowledge dissemination, I'm not talking about rural population. Generally, we think, oh, these rural population, Gaudi, they don't know anything. Our role is to teach them. That's how we perceive, and that's my uh, observations and understanding. That's what I did in the past. But I think things are other way around. We need to learn far more than what we can teach. When I say knowledge dissemination, I'm not talking only about the rural population or craftsmen. I'm talking about the policy makers. I'm talking about the engineers. I'm talking about the bureaucrats. And I'm talking about the academicians. Uh, let me share one story here. Why it is important to teach or give, give knowledge and understanding or confidence building to our bureaucrats or our policy makers. Let me share one story. After 2015 earthquake, I was talking with one of the um, very, very prominent uh, bureaucrat or a policy maker. What I suggested was that we should make some provision for damaged buildings. So these buildings could be repaired and strengthened and we should bring that in our policy. His simple response was, no, no. These, Barna, these old stone masonry buildings are very bad, they are weak. We should provide all people new buildings. And because we are giving them 200,000 Nepali rupees or 300,000 Nepali rupees, which was practically minuscule for constructing a house. So of course, the, what I advised was practically discarded, not adopted. What I see, when I go to earthquake affected area, these damaged buildings are still standing. People are living in these buildings. When you ask in the, the earthquake affected areas of Nepal, which is your house? They will show a two story house which was there before the earthquake. And then they will show another house, one story house and they say, oh, this is earthquake house. So that means this damaged and damaged vulnerable buildings are still there because of lack of confidence of the, the top policy maker on this vernacular construction and the confidence on that these buildings could be retrofitted. So of course, to, to achieve our goal, we need research in technical, social, cultural, and economic areas. Not only technical, because ultimately house is a social thing, it's a cultural and economic thing. So we need to focus on this area and promote and find a convergence between modern and 
traditional construction so we can make uh, building safer and provide building people um, safety. This equally, I, I focused on seismic safety, but this will equally apply to wind, flood, and other disasters. Why it is stopped? So this is my last slide. I'm not sure why uh, it is stopped. It is not moving. So next oh, slide is, thank you. I'm and if you have any questions. That. Well, um, thank you so much, Mr. Jitendra Botra. And I'm sorry that the slide froze. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Oh, here it got... is. You can see the slide. Okay, here is the slide. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any question, uh, I'm happy to right. uh, discuss. Well, that. thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Botra. Thank you so much for such a great uh, and timely presentation. I'd like to now hand, uh, hand, it, uh, hand over to Mr. Rajendra Desai. If you could just provide a few comments uh, on Mr. Jitendra Botra's presentation today, Mr. Desai, thank you. Sure. You know, it's, uh, you know, thank you for inviting me to IIDS event. It's really very interesting that you know, I'm sitting you know, way out in the West, uh, Jitendra Ji is sitting way out in the East and the rest of the people are in the center. You know, thanks to these modern technologies and maybe I think the side benefits of the pandemic you know, that such things are possible. Uh, coming to Jitendraji's presentation, I think it was really, you know, as the title says, reimagining, you know, and it's really very well reimagined, uh, you know, his ideas about traditional buildings. Uh, you know, which is which is really a very precious heritage, uh, which the world is likely to lose in another fifty to hundred years. The way things are going uh, now, you know, I mean, generally when when we talk about all these heritage and all that, you know, it, it becomes things do get romanticized. But Jitendra Ji has really maintained very objective approach in this whole analysis in his arguments. Uh, which which gives it more credibility, I think, for for a common man who is not an engineer to understand these things and appreciate. I think this is the way to go. Uh, and his arguments are based on you know four very important angles of safety, affordability, environmental connotations, and the cultural identity. And <clears throat> based on this, he has made a very effective case of bringing acceptability to the traditional systems through research and promotion. Uh, you know, because what, is, what has happened over the, over the I, I would say past several decades as, you know, the, I mean, we, all of us are marching towards what we call modernization and, uh, you know, our love for modernity. You know, we are, we are sort of looking down at all the, all the heritage we have. And specifically, when it comes to, as, as Jitendraji mentioned, the vernacular buildings uh, are looked down upon. You know, there is stigma attached to it. I mean, we see this in India and Nepal and the whole subcontinent. There's, there's no difference. And, uh, you know, as, as you rightly mentioned, these are looked upon as something very primitive, something which, is, uh, which has no future, you know, something to be discarded. And uh, to be forgotten, and uh, and and truly, people uh, feel ashamed. Uh, and um, I mean, our our personal experience also has been that you go in the village, and people feel ashamed about uh, about their old houses. And I mean, in fact, you know, our experience was once in up in Uttarakhand that there were two houses, as Jitendraji mentioned. One was a new house, a small one room structure, and the other was fantastic. 150 year old, very much earthquake resistant house made of stone and mud and timber. And the, the owner of the house said that the, the, the other house is for people like us, for the guests. You know, whereas, uh, you know, so because that is something that the owner felt proud of, you know, which very strangely, but I think this is where we are moving towards. And, uh, <clears throat> 
and and it's very contradictory these perceptions of you know that 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 he Jitendraji mentioned that the modern building is more comfortable and old buildings are not and in reality is the other way around i think the traditional buildings are more cozy <clears throat> and uh, the, the i think the modern buildings are much more harsh to our whole physical well being you know so now the past disasters uh, you know and you know the whole subcontinent have again and again showed that both type of buildings have suffered uh, and then because there are more vernacular buildings obviously you see more damage to vernacular buildings and and of course also the way uh, our perceptions are we we don't want to talk about damage to the modern buildings you know we want to talk you know we want to highlight especially <clears throat> the engineering community will always want to highlight the damage to the traditional buildings because in in their eyes they are outdated so the whole issue is that as as mr botra said the whole paradox of of you know the modern technology bringing safety to us you know and the question is has has it been able to bring safety and uh, you know go going back to or the past earthquakes you know again and again we have seen that you know whether it is recent 2015 nepal earthquake or going back to you know gujarat earthquake back in 2001 you know actually that was the real eye opener in the subcontinent for the first time we saw large scale destruction of modern buildings you know so but still still the mindset hasn't changed and uh, you know i mean actually in this presentation he has given excellent examples of these photographs the ones from kashmir ones from nepal side by side where where you can see how how poorly some of these modern buildings have, have performed uh, whereas the traditional properly made traditional buildings have performed so well you know but again you know the the establishment fails to recognize this and and when we go back to some of these disasters you know when like our our experience was way back in latur in 1993 where uh, you know when I mean, they it was category told categorically told that only the cement mortar will be used now ironically it was a, it was a water stamped area you know you are talking about the areas in a rain shadow where there is acute water scarcity and the government stand was that you know we will bring water by railway wagon now imagine if people don't have water to drink will they put water on the cement mortar for strengthening or will they will they, will they you know will they use it for the domestic purpose the other i think some of these very interesting comparisons that jitendra ji has shown in his presentation you know one is of the cost and the other is of the environmental aspect i think very i mean it's the, it's the hard numbers which tell you the reality and this whole thing of affordability is 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 something very very important you know we the, the politicians may wish that everyone should have what we call pakka house you know i mean you know the eastern nepal earthquake of 2011 you know we were in second in india and where the chief minister was hell bent on giving everyone a pakka house you know and and whether whether we can afford it whether even the whether the country can afford it i mean today what we are seeing in pakistan for example you know the the country is going bankrupt because of you know wrong expenses we do you know expenses we do on wrong things so the whole question and the see the issue here is this what people can do not what the government can do government with government's money maybe you can build one small room you know so you know i think in and the environmental aspect of how much carbon footprint each building has there is such huge difference between the two and i mean again i'll go back to palumtar where we were working back in 2019 and uh, i remember walking on, on on you know walking on a street in one of the villages there were people were sitting outside this newly built house and we asked them what they felt and they said it's so hot inside you know so now what do you do about the heat you know and I, i think in that case that particular case they did not have their old house because as it is as he said that in villages after villages we see the traditional house still standing maybe 
damaged or partially damaged or undamaged. And next to that, you have a modern house. And you know, where where will people sleep in hot summer afternoon? You know, that's you know, and the thing is whether whether can we provide electricity for air conditioning or cooling, even for fan? You know, is it is it really possible? I think the whole issue of viability also comes in the picture when we start comparing the modern system versus a traditional system. And I think the other issue is, you know, this the recycling of materials, the reuse of materials, because the traditional systems have this fantastic advantage that when the life of the house is over, you are able to recycle significant amount of material. And I would not say recycle, I'll say reuse because we are just taking the materials out and you're able to put that back to use. And sure enough, I mean, in the, in the in, you know, in, in urban areas, they've started to do that, but the process is so complicated and that process itself is so in in energy intensive, you know, because you know, you demolish the modern building and you, you, you break it down and you break it into fine particles like sand and then, you know, aggregates and then reuse that. It's an extremely complicated process. And the whole issue, where do you put the debris? Because that's, that's you know, the whole debris management from the demolished buildings is also another big, big aspect. So in reality, you know, I mean, I think the whole issue of maintaining the balance of where, what can be done. You know, one, one very interesting thing that Jitendra also brought out, which I'd never thought of, was, you know, going to this one of the uh, events in, in Rurki and looking at the papers which were submitted. I think very, very interesting numbers, you know, because that shows our whole education system. Where are we headed? You know, I, I graduated way back, you know, what, 52 years ago from IIT Bombay. And even at that time, we were taught only cement and steel. And today it's still no different. You know, when, when 80, 70, 80% of the population still lives in the traditional buildings. And, 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 you know, maybe, I mean, things are changing fast, sure, because the aspirations are changing. You know, you are being bombarded by the advertisements. You have, you know, also the establishment is also not favoring these things. You know, so I mean, interestingly, in the post-disaster situation, also, you know, the 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 rules are brought which prevent people from going back to the traditional systems. You know, I'll say improved traditional system, not necessarily the vulnerable systems, or you know, putting some science and technology into those systems and making them even better than what they are. But even that is also, there are so many hurdles. So, I mean, I think ultimately the whole issue is, as I said, I mean, the balance. What can be done? What is appropriate where? I'll, I'll give you one example from our own experience going back to 1993, 94 in Latour. Uh, and, you know, one donor from America had brought geodesic domes. And these are, you know, I mean, you know what the geodesic domes are. You know, these are kind of, you know, polygonal houses and uh, they look more like igloo from far away. And, you know, the Americans typically are very, very obsessed with material efficiency, you know. And they said, oh, the minimal materials are required in building a geodesic domes. So here is the area where the stone masonry mud mortar is the mainstay of housing. And you are, you know, shoving down this geodesic dome, you know, where, which was invented in America, where even people there are not interested in using them. And, uh, you know, so, and we, we, we were there more as technical activists and we were opposing such things. But then later on, several years down the road, you know, in, 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 in Gujarat state, in Kutch, in remote Kutch Island, the police wanted to build some colony. And the only thing they could do was use geodesic dome, because that's what we said that since there are no materials available on the island, very little water available. So, you know, geodesic dome elements could be, you know, made in the town and they could be taken there. And that was viable. So I think what is important is to look at what is appropriate and, and you know, where and, 
and go with that, have some balance, rather than this whole absolutely indiscriminate obsession with the modern buildings. And as he rightly said, uh, you know, to be, to be constructing buildings with cement and steel up in the mountains. Again, I'll go back to our experience back in Uttarakhand, where we were retrofitting a school building in a remote area. And also we are rebuilding that uh, part of that school. And it required some cement and steel for, for earthquake resisting elements. So the cement which was brought from Dehradun, it, was, it took about three days. And most surprisingly, when it reached the destination, most of the cement bags had hardened. We don't know how that happened. And the steel bars which were carried, because you know, typically the steel bar comes in the bundles which are 20 feet long, you know, they had to be bent and bent and bent and folded. You know, into four feet long bundles, and once they reach the site, again you you know you you put in so much effort to straighten them out, and then question of getting sand and aggregates, you know, I mean that's these these are materials so difficult to be found in the mountains, you know. So these kind of experiences are very common. Still, we get obsessed, you know, with the modern systems, and I think ultimately, as Jitendra just said that having a balance, having that discretion to be exercised and, and getting to sensitize the, the establishment that let's do something which is viable and which is beneficial in long term to the community. I think that's that in nutshell what Jitendra just said very well. And uh, that's about, you know, that I have to say in this paper. So, Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Desai. Thank you so much. Uh, let's open up the floor for discussions. I might have to leave uh, after five minutes if that's okay, Mr. Botha, but you know, someone is going to take that's over okay. because I have to teach. I'm really sorry. Okay. But no, uh, I'd really like to thank you and Mr. Desai for joining us. So we have a few questions. So uh, we have uh, Mr. Srizan Badur Malla. Mr. Malla, would you want to ask a question? You could, if kindly, turn the camera on if you want to. You can you know, remain as you want to. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Malla. Uh, thank you, Robin, sir. And thank you, Jitana. Uh, thank you, Rajendra, sir, for this comprehensive and very, uh, very practical presentation. And since I'm working in this disaster governance in Nepal as an expert, I have a question to Jitendra uh, Bhotra, sir. As we all know that uh, there is a charm for this concrete building is growing everywhere in the world. That is one scenario, right? Now the next one is in countries like Nepal, where the this illiteracy rate is much high, there is lack of knowledge as well. That is the second scenario. And third one is even the government policies that su support the establishment, uh, that support the building of these concrete buildings, even their own buildings are, are, uh, are the concrete ones. And <clears throat> in this complexity, how do you foresee the future of these vernacular buildings and how do you think the government should should uh, intervene to, to support or to promote these kind of buildings in countries like Nepal and and if you have if you have any example of the nations of of this any government that has supported this kind of construction thank you Jitendra. thank you uh, for the question as I mentioned earlier, we are very heavily invested on in promoting modern construction and discarding and discrediting uh, the vernacular construction. Yeah, of course, there are problems with vernacular construction, same as with the modern construction. But when we talk about the, as I also mentioned about uh, knowledge sharing and dissemination of knowledge, until we bring some policies and there is some understanding we develop, among the policy makers who are prepared to invest in vernacular construction, it's very difficult to bring a change. I give one example of university where, to me, education should broaden our life, our mind. But what is happening is basically the education is putting us in a tunnel and basically brainwashing us. There's only two systems, uh, the, sorry, only modern system exists. So it has a vernacular system has become 
elephant in a room. So of course, uh, until we make an impact on education system, it's a very difficult to bring some change because the change is basically starts from the education. So we have to start there, but of course, few people have to lead, uh, lead and uh, march uh, in front to bring a change. It is a very, it will be an uphill task because I'm working on this for the last 30 years almost. And I decided uh, as my senior is working for maybe more than 40 years and still we are struggling. So it will be, it is an uphill task, but of course change will come as we learn lessons. And I think there is a change is coming. I'm not, I can't give you an example, but now if you look at until 90s, early 70s, 80s, 90s, there are simple things is we can solve all the problems. Disaster can be mitigated. Now slowly we have learned, no, we have to learn from the traditional knowledge. We have to gain traditional knowledge and live with the disaster, accommodate with the disaster. So whole paradigm is shifting. Uh, to us the no, traditional knowledge. So it will take time, but it's a happy. Thank you. Hello. Uh, in, Azur, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Malla. I hope uh, Mr. Botra was able to answer your question. Uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, Mr. Samar Rana, if that's okay, for the last five minutes, because I have to go yes. and teach. I'm really sorry about that because of the time difference. No, thank you for organizing uh, this. On behalf of IDS, I really want to thank Mr. Botha and Mr. Desai and all the audience. So, Samar, over to you. If you could, uh, you know, uh, handle this for the last five minutes, I would be very grateful. Thank you, sir, once again. Okay. Bye-bye, Mr. Desai. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Mr. Botha. Samar? Yeah. So do we have any yeah. other questions? In the chat box also, it seems like we don't have any other question or no one else is raising the hand. So I think uh, I would just like to thank the speaker and the discussion, the speaker Jitendra Bhotra and the discussion uh, Rajendra Desai. Uh, thank you for and, and all the particip participants for joining in. And we will be uh, we will be again live uh, for episode 26 next month, the first of Monday. And I would like to end this episode and like to thank everyone else for joining in. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Samarji, and good night to everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye.